Well, good morning, Grace Church. It's so good to have you here. Thank you so much for being a part of this service today. I'm glad you came. I want to especially welcome all of you who are participating today in the worship center. Maybe you're watching online. In whatever venue you are, I am delighted you're here. Thank you for participating and for sharing in this uh, wonderful day. You know, several months ago, my wife and I were driving to visit some of her relatives in Virginia, and we turned on to a ramp that took us up to an interstate which was elevated above buildings. And we headed down the interstate just a few feet and stopped. We were hemmed in on every side. There was no way to get off the interstate. There was no way to find an exit. There was no way to turn around. And worst of all, there was no bathroom. All we could do was sit and wait and wait for the traffic to clear it took about maybe 90 minutes maybe a couple hours i can't remember exactly we later learned that ahead of us there was a tunnel and just in front of the tunnel there had been an accident that had to be cleared which stopped all the traffic you know i've thought about that experience several times since then it's a pretty good parable of life for all of us It's easy to head blindly into a situation that we're not expecting, only to realize this is a mess. It's nothing but a dead end. In that moment, we can feel surrounded and trapped and even overwhelmed. Some of you are saying, sounds like my week. Some of you are saying, sounds like a typical week for me. I don't know about you, but I'm a fan of those old Murphy's Laws. Maybe you've heard some of them. Inside, every problem is a series of small problems struggling to get out. (laughs) Another one says, nothing as easy as it looks. Everything takes longer than you think. If anything can go wrong, it will. And here's one. A day without a crisis is a total loss. Most of us know about that. And maybe here's my favorite. Murphy who came up with all those, was an optimist. (laughs) See, almost every day, you and I are attacked by problems that drain our energy and demand our attention. Sometimes it's as basic as the weather. Sometimes it's delays on the highways or at the airport. Sometimes it involves who won or lost a ball game. Many times it's something far more serious. It involves maybe irritations or disappointments at work. Sometimes it's a health crisis. Sometimes it's a financial challenge. Sometimes it's a legal issue. We are inundated with all of this stuff that just seems to overwhelm us and surround us and pressure us. We describe those situations in different ways. We might say, I'm in a real jam. You might say, I'm between a rock and a hard place or I'm up against a wall. Somebody defined a crisis like this. When an attorney who specializes in medical malpractice finds that he needs major surgery, that's a crisis. Now, I don't know what crisis you brought with you today, but I'm guessing just about everybody that's here, whether you're in this room, whether you're in the worship center, whether you're watching online, just about all of us face some kind of crisis. Maybe your crisis developed because of a series of unwise decisions that you've made. Or maybe you're facing a crisis because of the fallout from somebody else's choices. I don't know the reason for the crisis that you might be experiencing. Maybe your problem has something to do with a problem at school or maybe a problem at home. I wonder how many of you would agree this morning that a week rarely passes without a crisis right? I mean, just about all of us would experience that. Years ago, Thomas Paine referred to those moments as the, t- as the times that try men's souls. That's exactly what they do. One author just said it like this, we are continually faced with a series of great opportunities brilliantly described as unsolvable problems. Now, Here's the issue for us. It's easy to have a flawed view of life. It's easy to think that if we really seek to follow God, that we should never face a crisis. 
It's really a Pollyanna theology about life, and that's just not true. In fact, years ago, one author said it like this, what we do in a crisis always depends on whether we see the difficulties in light of God or God in the shadow of the difficulties. I believe that. What we do in a crisis always depends on whether we see the difficulties in light of God or God in the shadow of the difficulties. Many years ago, the people of Israel had to learn that lesson. So today I want to turn your attention to one of the most fascinating stories in all the Bible. It's recorded in the 14th chapter of the book of Exodus. If you have a copy of the scriptures with you, why don't you turn with me to Exodus chapter 14, the second book of the Old Testament. Today we continue the series that we've called Miracles. We're looking at several stories that remind us of how God still today wants to do the impossible in us. Last week, we learned that he wants to do the impossible in our lives. In the next couple of weeks, we'll study how he wants to do the impossible for us and through us. Today, we discover that sometimes God even wants to do the impossible in spite of us, in spite of our attitude, in spite of how we feel about things. And as you come to chapter 14 in Exodus, you need to realize that the people of Israel at this point in their history, had spent 430 years in slavery in the land of Egypt. God had supernaturally delivered them, however, from that bondage by sending 10 plagues, 10 terrible plagues, to affect the Egyptian people. And because of those plagues, the king of Egypt sent Moses and all the people of Israel out of his land. He didn't want to have anything more to do with them. So under the leadership of Moses, somewhere around 2 million people start to leave the land of Egypt and make their way across the desert of the Sinai, the wilderness. And it wasn't long until the king of Egypt changed his mind. He decided he couldn't get along with all, without all that free labor, so he sent his army after the Israelites to bring them back into the land of Egypt. And when we come to Exodus 14, the people of Israel, God's people, are facing an impossible situation. The Red Sea is in front of them. They are surrounded on either side by mountains, and the Egyptian army is chasing them from behind. There is no way, from a human standpoint, that they could escape. It is the ultimate definition of a crisis. And frankly, when we come to Exodus 14, we discover that they respond to a crisis They responded to that crisis in about the same way you and I tend to. First of all, the Bible tells us in verse 11 that they complain. They complain. Look at what it says. The Israelites said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? See, it hadn't been long since God had miraculously delivered them. Yet they forgot all about that miracle that he performed as he sent those plagues to Egypt so that they could escape Egypt and the slavery that was there. It's amazing what a crisis will do to your attitude. It's easy to feel like a human peacock, somebody said. When things are going well in life, we tend to strut around like we're large and in charge. But when things begin to crumble, we think, this is a mess. What did I do to deserve this? And we forget, listen, our tendency is to forget all that God has done. We forget too quickly. That's exactly what happened to these people. So they complain. There's something else that they did. The Bible tells us in verse 12 that they started to compare. They started to compare. Look at verse 12. Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. So let me get this right for a minute. The Israelites wanted to go back into slavery where their men were beaten and their women were abused? I don't think so. 
I don't think so. But you know, what they did is so typical of all of us, isn't it? Whenever we face a problem that seems too big for us, whenever it seems like it's overwhelming, whenever we're facing a crisis that we just can't figure out, whenever we're headed for a dead end, whenever we feel like we're surrounded by the issues of life, there are just too many things that are pressing in on us, here's what we do. We not only complain against God and say, God, don't you know that this is going on in my life? Don't you care about what's happening? We tend to think things were a whole lot better in the past. We tend to long for the good old days, which, right, really weren't all that good, if we're honest with ourselves. It's exactly what the Israelites did. If you're in a crisis long enough, listen, if you're in a crisis long enough, you'll begin to question just about everything, just about everything related to God. And we tend to do exactly what these Israelites did. We complain, we compare, but the story doesn't end there. You see, Moses refused to let the people have a pity party. The time that remains, I want to outline for you some ways to respond when you face the inevitable, when you face a crisis, when you face a problem that just seems to hem you in and surround you on every side that seems bigger than you're able to handle. There are four principles to remember when there appears to be no way out. Okay, so you might want to get out a pen or pencil and jot down these four basic ideas. They're very basic, easy to remember. Here we go. They all start with W, all right? First of all, when you face a crisis, remember God wants you to wait. He wants you to wait. In verse 13, the Bible says, Moses answered the people, do not be afraid, stand firm. How many of you hate the word wait? Raise your hand. I do. I do. I hate to wait in line. I hate to wait in traffic. I hate to wait. You name it, I hate to wait. I'm not good at patience. You know the three most common words when we face a crisis? Usually, it's something like, God, do something. (laughs) Just do something. Help now. Right? It is totally against human nature to stand still and do nothing. Right? especially when we face a problem. If you're like me, all of your problem-solving skills start just kind of kicking in, trying to figure out what to do next, right? Author Jack Hayford wrote, We live in an instant credit, get-everything-now economy. We want what we want now on the basis of something that requires little or nothing of us. Waiting is not in style, and patience has never been a forte of the flesh. Guilty as charged. Patience has never been a forte of my flesh. Many of you know that I'm not a mixed Mr. Fix-It kind of guy. I don't have a tool belt at home equipped with all the screwdrivers and wrenches to fix every problem in our house. But you know what I've learned? I've learned that I am a Mr. Fix-It kind of guy when it comes to people problems. And when people that I know and love have problems, I want to fix them right now. I can't always do that. Many times I can't do that. Somebody else wrote, Patience is accepting a difficult situation without giving God a deadline to handle it. Let me say it again. Patience is, a diff- is accepting a difficult situation without giving God a deadline to handle it. King David wrote in the 27th Psalm, Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. I love these words of the prophet Isaiah. The Lord is a faithful God, 
Blessed are those who wait for his help. Raymond Edmond, who at one time was the president of Wheaton College, wrote a book called The Disciplines of Life. And in that book, he said, we feel we must be active and energetic, humanly effective. We cannot understand why inactivity, weakness, weariness, and, some t- and seemingly uselessness should be our lot. It all appears so foolish and futile. And then he makes this profound statement. The delay that instructs and prepares us saves time. It never loses it. Some of you are in a situation right now. Some of you are facing a crisis right now where God is asking you to wait. Just wait. Do you know why he wants you to do that? Well, verse 14 in this chapter tells us, look at it. Moses says, the Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. Just stay calm. In other words, when we wait on the Lord, when we wait for God to start working, when we wait for God's activity to begin, he fights for us. It gives him time to work. First lesson, when you face a crisis... Wait. Wait for God to work. Secondly, watch. Watch what he does. Watch what God begins to do. Let's keep reading in verse 13. Moses says, stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you'll never see again. You know what the natural instinct is for all of us? If we can't solve the problem right away, you know what we tend to do? We tend to run. We tend to run away. We run to a negative attitude. We run to a different counselor. We run to a different relationship. We run to a different church. We run to our favorite addiction. We even run away from God. You see, if you run away when you face a crisis, you will miss what God is going to do. I love the last part of this verse. It says, the Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. Boy, was that the truth. And we'll see that in a moment. It's such a liberating thought. And you might be facing a situation today where God would say to you, wait and watch what I'm going to do. And he just might say to you, the very thing that you're facing that seems overwhelming, that seems to just bury you right now, is something that you're never going to see again. I love the paraphrase of Ecclesiastes chapter 7. See the way God does things and fall into line. Fall into line. I like that. In other words, give God time to work. I like these words that I came across recently. When I panic, I run. When I run, I lose. When I lose, God waits. But when I wait, he fights. When he fights, he wins. And when he wins, I learn. You've probably heard the old saying, God helps those who help themselves. Do you believe that? (laughs) Do you believe that? I hope you don't. God helps those who are helpless. And most of us who live in this culture, in this society, in this country, for which we're grateful, have a hard time with that. Because we like to take charge and get things solved on our timetable. 
but the God of heaven loves to step in and help those who are helpless and broken. Many years ago, when I was a a young boy, I might have told you about this story. We had a gal that uh, watched my brother and I, we'd call her a babysitter today, I suppose, or somebody who would come over to our house and watch us when my parents had something to do. And to make a very, very long story short, she began to develop some physical problems. The doctors couldn't figure out exactly what was wrong with her. And uh, eventually they discovered she had multiple sclerosis. Her story has been verified by doctors. Her story has been recorded in a number of different magazine articles. I still remember learning from the, the news that for, as far as we knew, uh, Barbara, her, na- her nickname was Babs, was probably gonna die. She was in a hospital bed in her home. She was uh, breathing with uh, the assistance of a machine. Her muscles had atrophied in her legs. She wasn't able to stand. And from all we knew, uh, it was not gonna be long until she was with the Lord. One day, Bab sensed that God was saying to her, out of nowhere, my child, get up. And in that moment, she somehow rolled out of bed and stood on her feet, something that she hadn't been able to do. Eventually, a doctor was called into the room. And she consulted with a doctor, and and the doctor said, after feeling her calves, he said, Babs, you have calves. Your muscle tone has returned. Now, this happened many years after I had had gone away to college and even gotten married. I learned about her story. And today, she's a pastor's wife in Virginia, serving God. You see, when God decides to work, he loves to help those are helpless. I have no human explanation for that story and neither do the doctors. It is the clearest case of healing from God himself I've ever seen in my life. You see, as long as we think we're helping ourselves, who needs God? It's when we reach the end of the line, when we're dangling out in space and we finally cry out, God, Help me that he loves to respond. When I'm facing a crisis, God, first of all, asks me to wait. Then he asks me to watch. There's a third lesson in the story. When I'm facing a crisis, he asks me to walk by faith. To walk by faith. Some of you might know what happened next. If you look down at verse 21, the Bible tells us Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and a wall of water on their left. Now I have to tell you, Hollywood has never been able to capture the power of what happened in that moment. Maybe the most familiar clip of all actually was filmed featuring Charleston Charlton Heston as Moses more than 50 years ago in this vintage scene. Some of you might remember this. Watch this for a minute. Behold his mighty hand. I know that's cheesy and melodramatic, 
But I want to ask you something. Imagine if you were one of those people with walls of water as high as the room in which you're sitting, maybe higher. Would you walk through? Would you be the first one to take the step? You see, the essence of real faith is when we trust God to do what is impossible. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians, we walk by faith, not by sight. Well, the story doesn't end here. The chapter goes on to tell us that God brought confusion to the Egyptian army. They followed the Israelites with those walls of water into the bottom of the Dead Sea. And you know what happened? Confusion, mass confusion happened. The Bible tells us in the next few verses that God sent confusion to the Egyptians. The wheels of their chariots began to fall off and they were trapped with walls of water on either side. And the water collapsed. And all of them drowned. And the writer of Hebrews just summarizes the whole scene with these simple words. The people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land, but when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. Wait. Watch. Walk by faith. One more lesson in the story. Worship. Worship. If you look down at verse 31, the Bible says, When the people of Israel saw the mighty power that the Lord had unleashed against the Egyptians, they were filled with awe before him. They put their faith in the Lord and in his servant Moses, I love that. It always happens when God works. Do you understand this morning, this is exactly what God wants from all of us? He wants our undivided loyalty, our undivided hearts. He wants our undivided allegiance. He wants our untamed worship. And he will allow us to get to the end of ourselves so that we will fully and completely turn to him. The truth is today, he may have allowed you to face a crisis, to feel like you are surrounded, to feel like you are hemmed in, to feel like you are overwhelmed for this very reason. So you will come to the end of yourself and say, oh God, I need you to intervene in my life. Maybe, maybe what you need to do is turn from the way you've been going, turn from your sin, and turn to his way. Embrace what he has for you. The Bible word for that is repentance. The God who knows all about you invites you to place your faith in the greatest thing that he's ever done for you or ever will do for you. You see, he demonstrated the depth of his love for you when Jesus came to this world to die on a Roman cross to satisfy his own justice that he should direct at you and me. And now he invites us to turn from our way and to embrace what he's done for us on that cross to receive the forgiveness that only he can offer and to give him our undivided worship as Lord and God. I love this little sentence that comes out of the Gospel of Luke as the people looked at what Jesus did. The words say, and they were all amazed at the greatness of God. Do you realize this morning, listen, 
do you realize that the God of heaven is a do-it-anyway kind of God? I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what crisis is about to overwhelm you. I don't know what problems that you've encountered in your life. I don't know how you feel overwhelmed and hemmed in. But I know this. God is a God who will do it anyway. Sometimes God chooses to act even in spite of us. In spite of our lack of faith. Because that's the kind of God that he is just as he did with the Israelites. I want to ask you something. Where are you facing a dead end this morning? What kind of impossible situation are you facing that just seems more than you can overcome? Maybe it's a relationship that's gone bad, that's fractured. Maybe it's a health crisis that seems overwhelming. Maybe it's a problem in your workplace. Maybe it's some financial story. I don't know. The list is almost endless. It's just life, isn't it? Are you willing to let God be God? To wait on him, to watch what he does, to walk by faith, and to humble your heart in worship when he acts. I'm going to ask you to bow your head right now. And here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like everybody in this room to find that little response card that was mentioned earlier. And I'd like you to answer this question. What crisis are you facing? that seems more than you can handle today? What problem is in your life that is about to bury you? Just a a word or two, I want you to take a pen or pencil and in the box at the bottom of that card, I want you to list, just list the crisis that seems bigger than you can handle today that you brought with you, the problem that only God could solve. I don't know what it is, God does. As you list that problem, I want you to give it to him. Just give it to him. There are some today who've been listening to this study. The truth of your life is that you have yet to begin a relationship with this God who knows all there is to know about you, who loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus into this world to die on your behalf so that you could experience his forgiveness and have a relationship with him for this life and forever. Maybe you'd like to begin that relationship right now. All around this room, in the worship center, wherever you are right now, say, Lord Jesus, this is for me. Today is my day. October 2nd, 2016. Today is my day. I'm turning from my sin to your way. I'm asking for your forgiveness and I'm asking you to save me. Give me new life with you. If if you prayed those words, I'd like you to find that little response card in the box. I just want you to write the date. Just write the date. October 2nd, 2016. Your day. You're born a second time. Thank you, Lord God, for your promises the truth that changes us, that you are God and God alone. In the name of Jesus, 